your alternative talk radio contact, the planet, KGRARadio.com. With infinite complacency, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yeah, Ken, this uh, was not intentional to wait an entire, what, five years after I started my show to have you on. That is for sure. We've actually met in person at whatever year Mothman Festival that was. I don't even recall what year that was. Uh, 2016, I think. Okay, you're better with dates than I am by far. I yeah, think. okay. Yeah, that was a while ago. 16 yeah. or 17, one of those. Yeah. Probably. Which was so fun. What an amazing festival to go to. But uh, no, my point is, I am so sorry that it took this long to get you on ITF. You know, it's one of those things where I have this list of people that, of course, even before I really started my show, that I was like, okay, well, this is a no-brainer. You have this, 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 this person to get on. But then you get these emails that come in. They're like, I danced with the devil under the pale moonlight. And you're like, I want to talk to you right now. <laughs> so it's kind yeah. of what I don't know why I gave that person an accent. I apologize, everyone. <laughs> but um, it's just one of those things. So I'm glad that you're finally on with me. Uh, and of course, a huge thank you. And we are so happy to have you aboard for Beyond the Fray Publishing. You were our very first author that we signed. And we are, are very proud to have oh. you on board. Well, thank you. It was an yes. honor, and uh, I've really enjoyed working with you and Jeff. And um, yeah, I, I've, I've been real happy with it so far, and uh, I appreciate you guys reaching out to me. No doubt. Absolutely. And yeah, so as I said before, I will we'll touch on both your newest book, The Essential Guide to Bigfoot, and then close up with just you know maybe a couple of your favorite encounters from Encounters with Flying Humanoids because. Uh, I and lots of my listeners are fascinated by that topic. So, and I hate to do this to yeah. you, but we have to in case there might be a couple of people out there that don't know much about you. But it is the quintessential question that is most oft asked to open a show. And that is, how in the world did you get into all this? Uh, well, people do ask me that quite a bit, actually, because <laughs> it is kind of an unusual, <laughs> unconventional pursuit. So um, I, I totally get that. Um, I, what I tell people is it was never a planned strategy. Um, I was just kind of, um, you know, always interested in monsters as a kid, like a lot of kids, and I uh, loved monster movies, and I had a lot of weird exotic snakes and alligators and things as pets, so uh, I loved critters. And my dad was a forestry professor, so I had a, kind of a, a lot of exposure to the outdoors. I loved animals. And um, when I first learned about cryptozoology, it just seemed like it was kind of a, a perfect mosaic of those two concepts animals and monsters kind of blended together but um when i was eight years old believe it or not i still had never heard of bigfoot until i was about eight and i saw a tv show in the 70s and you know it's just like uh something clicked i mean i was just thought it was fascinating and uh spent a lot of time at the library trying to find all the books i could and but what was really helpful was my mother was a very adventurous person and uh, she loved to travel. She was a travel agent, so she took me on a lot of amazing trips around the world, and we camped along the Amazon and the Galapagos Islands and Australia and all these places. And wherever I went, wherever we traveled, I was always investigating, at least as a kid, as much as a kid could, I was researching the local legendary creatures because you find them wherever you go. And um, <clears throat> my mom knew of this, and uh, when I was 15 years old, uh, we went to Loch Ness in Scotland. So I got to spend a, a week up there, and um, uh, I spent a lot of time kind of sitting by the lake with my 8 millimeter movie camera, and I interviewed some local people. And so, you know, it's just been something I've done my whole life, but, um, you know, I never really planned on making it a full-time thing uh, until my music career. I had a long music career and kind of got burned out on that and was looking for something else. And 
I just met with met with some good people that were Bigfoot researchers, and they started taking me out. And you know, I wrote a book. I met Lauren Coleman. He told me to write a, write a book. And that was really good advice because he was one of my idols. I was like, okay, that's so. You know, it's just been, I've just been very blessed to have to have had a lot of cool opportunities. And um, yeah, I, I I love what I do. Yeah, I guess if Lauren Coleman kind of pokes and prods you for a book, you're like, okay, yes, I will. Yes, no problem. I, I think I will. Well, That's yeah, a good his, idea. His, his, you book, know? Yeah, his books were so influential, and I, I wanted to get into the field, and I asked him, you know, how can I you know, kind of make a name for myself? And that was great advice he gave me. He said, if you write a book, you'll become a de facto expert on a topic, and you, then you'll get start to do interviews and lectures, and you know, it'll open doors for you, and it absolutely did. Yeah, and something that you talk about in the Essential Guide to Bigfoot, which is available for ebook and uh, paperback, uh, go to Amazon. Head to Amazon for the both uh, versions of that. But you've, like you said, your your mother loved to travel, and then with your father's profession, you have been all over the world. And not only then for your own personal research, the the family trips, and then of course the subsequent TV shows that you've done. Um, I mean, you've already brought the Loch Ness, which I, I made note to talk about because I thought it was so amazing that even at the age of 15, you were already out there interviewing folks, literally sitting right by Loch Ness in Scotland and handling business out there because that was your passion. So what about some other memorable experiences, even if they had nothing to do with maybe actual research on a cryptid on, on any of these trips? But what would have been some of the most memorable times for you? Well, going to the camping along the Amazon river in the jungle was a pretty amazing thing i got to meet you know uh primitive tribes like the hivaro and the yagua tribes you know and watch them use blow darts to hunt monkeys and you know i got to experience all kinds of animals um i kind of got in trouble with my we had a guide and i kept picking things up you know i picked up a tarantula he knocked it out of my hand and killed it with a machete i then i picked up this uh this caterpillar that was really colorful and apparently it was deadly oh. and, uh, i didn't know that so he knocked that out so whoopsie you know but but uh, i loved you know that kind of started my my love of of jungle habitat and uh, kind of uh the galapagos islands on that same trip um we hit a lot of things in south america machu picchu of course which was pretty amazing but the galapagos and getting up close you know i was within a few feet of like an 18 foot elephant seal that roared at me and it was pretty amazing so um hiking across australia we were in the outback i got to climb Ayers rock which uh i'm sorry that's probably a disrespectful name now they've they've reverted to the aboriginal name which they should but Mm -hmm. um learned about the bunyip out there which is kind of a legendary water creature hadn't heard of the yowie when i was out there but uh, those Mm -hmm. are two that were pretty amazing and um Switzerland, believe it or not, I loved. My dad and I went hiking through the Alps, and uh, I was looking for the Totzelwurm, which was a kind of a legendary dragon-like creature that was said to live in caves up in the Alps. I didn't find one. But, How um, big of a of a creature is that supposed to be? It's not real big. It's probably you know three to five feet long. Um, they call it also. It's also known as the spring worm because it supposedly it pounces on people or springs at people. It's got a cat-like head and a kind of a serpentine body, mm. blunt serpentine body, and I think two legs in the front, but none in the back. So that's kind of the, the general description of the Totsil Verm. There haven't been any sightings for like a century, so I mean, it's kind of an old story. But back in the day, the, the Totsil Verm was actually in different Bavarian hunting guides and hiking guides that you might run across this dangerous reptilian creature that sprung out of holes at you. But... Um, so, um, yeah, those are, those are three that kind of spring to mind. Those were all kind of amazing experiences, and Loch Ness as well. Have you ever come across anyone that has said they have seen a dragon, like the classic Game of Thrones type of a dragon? Mm, no, but, you know, that's there's a lot of amorphous kind of gray areas, in, in as you know, in, in this stuff, Shannon. So when you say, like, a traditional dragon, you know, what does that mean? A dragon is a wide, pretty widespread, probably the most widespread mythical creature in the world. Now, mm-hmm. I have interviewed people that claim that they've seen living flying reptiles, winged reptiles known as pterosaurs that have a long reptilian tail and bat-like wings, and to me, that's a dragon, you know, so, I mean, it's, right. if, you look at a, if you look at a reconstruction of a pterosaur, I mean, they look very dragon-like, so, I mean, but uh, nothing like, you know, out of Game of Thrones or, 
<laughs> no, no fire Marines, breathing or yeah, yeah. No, nothing quite like that. Yeah. That I can at least not that I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, if there's any actual mother of dragons out there, get in touch with us. We would love to talk to you. <laughs> I, I, yeah, Ken wouldn't, wouldn't mind writing a book about that. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> as far as the Amazon. I find that fascinating because, well, you mentioned already this, the spiders. I'm not a huge fan of spiders. Snakes, I don't mind. You know, I'll, I'll kiss a massive rat mm-hmm. or something, but s- spiders, forget it. Um, I think that as far as the, a place like the Amazon goes, especially because I'm a fan of mm-hmm. the show Naked and Afraid, and a huge shout out mm-hmm. to a few of those guys because I actually know they listen to my show, and I'm, I'm very flattered by that because I love that show. But I would think that the just the bug situation alone in a place like the amazon not only is it dangerous with certain kinds of ants and like you said caterpillars but Mm. just the mental aspect of that like do you think that you could ever uh, you're a great person to ask this because you are out in the in the bush so much do you think and besides the whole naked aspect do you think that you could go on a show like that and just get through you know if it was like a 40-day challenge or something like you know in a breeze um well Admittedly, I, I like to think I have a little bit of survival game, but um, I'm getting a little older now, and I'm in my 50s, so uh, I'm in pretty reasonable good shape. And I know there have probably been people on that show that have been in that age group, but I imagine those people are more physically active than I am in terms of working out every day and stuff. So, um, um, you know, maybe when I was younger, I would have, you know, given it a go. But um, I don't really, I've watched the show, I love the show, but I, you know, I live vicariously through the contestants. I don't yeah, think I yeah. actually want, <laughs> they always, all of them lose 20 pounds and they just look really emaciated oh. and, and miserable by the end. And I, I get it, I understand it's all about overcoming and, yeah. you know, and persevering. And I, I think that's cool and that's why the show is popular. But um, no, I, I, you know, that said, I understand that when you do go even like on an expedition, which I've mounted expeditions in the jungles of Central America to search for things, and, you know, it's it's pretty, you know, it's pretty difficult, you know. I mean, I, I'm never quite at that level of survival where you're hunting for food and stuff. I mean, but uh, still, you know, there, it's, it's pretty treacherous. And um, to that point, there have been other cryptozoologists that have gone, of course, to Sumatra to search for the Orang Pendek, uh, to go to the uh, Congo to search for Mokele and Bembe. And I know some of those guys, and some of them got malaria and staph infections and just mm. all kinds of horrible, you know. So it's a pretty, even just doing standard research where you're stocked up with provisions and you're not naked. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, you got, you know, you can still, you're putting your body through a lot, quite a bit, when you go into some of those habitats. So, um, but uh, no, I don't, don't think I would want to be on Naked and Afraid at this point. See, at this point, so there is hope out there, everybody, see? Uh, no, but yeah. th- did you see that episode where one of the producers, it might have been the Amazon, I'm not sure, but he got bit by the, the vertical lance on his foot, and yeah. most of his foot just was gone. It just, like, melted away down to the, you could see the bones and the tendons and everything. I'm like, oh. And he was just out scouting locations. And he had, like you said, he had clothes on, boots. He might even have snake boots on, I don't know. If they can go through yeah, that. No, that's, that's scary. When I, the same thing, when I was do my expeditions in Belize, that's the scariest thing is the fertile ants, which mm. can drop out of trees. And we were, we were in some pretty remote areas, so we were real worried about that. If, if we you know, come across one, I mean, you would certainly be dead before you could make it to a, to a hospital or get medical attention. If you didn't have, I'm sure like that TV crew probably had, uh, you know, medical people on on the sidelines and stuff but um so they're scary. dropping out of trees because they're territorial and you will be walking under the canopy and they will drop down for the means of attacking you yeah, that's what i've heard yeah wow nope. i mean not not always in trees i mean they're they're primarily right. a terrestrial snake but uh they can climb and uh but they're just they they have more of a hyper aggressive temperament disposition yeah. and i guess that's the thing is there are there are other highly venomous snakes that don't that will avoid you at all costs but uh some like mambas and fertile ant snakes just seem to be ultra aggressive for for whatever reason it's just so messed up i mean they're already highly poisonous and aggressive and then they're above you in the trees it's like well let's yeah. just can't there be something <laughs> on our side here when we're going You're out watching and where you <laughs> carefully watching where you step so you don't step yeah. on one and then one drops on your head so yeah you can't win <laughs> snakes like gotcha gonna really mess your day up now uh i think if i was to go on a show like that for i mean the, the like i said the mental aspect of the bugs 
but I think that the hunt, because I'm mm. like a hobbit, like I like to, every couple hours, I'm like, you know, eating some. My my partner would probably have to be pretty worried that I would just kill and eat him uh, at some point, you know, during the end of the trip. So I think that that would be the the real thing that my partner would have to watch out for. Like, forget the fertilances. You got to watch out for me. But yeah, anyway. Um, oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a quick <laughs> story that'll freak you out. Like, Uh-oh. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, pre- I'm pretty okay with bugs and creepy crawly things, especially since I've been at the San Antonio Zoo because I handle a lot of tarantulas and scorpions and things like giant stick bugs that go up your arm. And so I'm okay with all that stuff. My sister is terrified of cockroaches. And uh, when we were, she was, of course, with, it was a family trip. So uh, when we were in the Amazon staying in our, in our tent, uh, we'd have the light on in the tent and you could see the silhouette of these cockroaches that are like as big as rats <laughs> crawling on the top of the tent and it's like she was so freaked out like screaming and stuff because these giant i mean they're not even in the tent but you could just see how big they were was they're crawling over the tent and uh yeah so i get it <laughs> she's like are there small dogs out here in the Amazon. Everything's big in the Amazon. The ants oh. are huge. The uh, everything is just gigantic size. It's uh, it's pretty weird. Mm, I remember when Fear Factor was still on. I'm sorry, everybody. We're just got, we're off on a tangent, but you know I like to do that. Uh, when Fear Factor was on, it, in fact, it happened to be a Vegas episode, and they were part of the thing that Fear Factor was is something you know like mostly heights and eating disgusting things, and yep. mm-hmm. they had the cave dwelling spiders i don't remember where they were from but it was one of the most hideous things i've ever seen i'm going that has got to be straight from hades and the girl actually put it in there and chomped on i could not i will never forget Mm. that episode of fear factor (laughs) i'll have to try to find it and a youtube clip and link that for anybody that's never seen that the cave dwelling spider from goodness knows where i don't remember but anyway um okay let me let me hone back in here i am sorry um so also from the Essential Guide to Bigfoot, uh, if you don't mind, uh, let's go to uh, Cato National Grasslands in uh, in 2003, and you had an interesting uh, encounter where you really felt pretty convinced that you were close to one of these these big guys. Yeah, uh, and of course, one of the most oft asked questions I get is, "Have you ever seen a cryptid?" And uh, I never have seen one with my my bare eyes, but um, I'm fairly convinced that I was within about 40 or 50 yards of a Bigfoot or Sasquatch in the cattle grasslands. Uh, as you mentioned, back in 2003, we were in a, it was a pretty remote area. We had heard there were some pretty dramatic sightings, recent sightings of a Bigfoot around this lake. And um, when we got there, we camped out, and uh, I was with some other researchers, of course. And uh, just after the sun went down, we decided to hike around the lake, and I was kind of the audio-video guy. I had a video camera and an audio recorder and stuff, and uh, suddenly something started making this noise, and it was in the brush. We couldn't see it. Very thick brush up there, but it it sounded just like an ape, and um, I've got a recording of it still, but it was kind of a deep... I described it as like it sounded almost like a mixture of like heavy breathing or panting, laughter, and grunting, so Mm. very deep, very scary. And uh, we all immediately looked at each other to verify, okay, none of us have ever heard anything like that before. It's not, you know, we're, these guys I'm with are like lifelong outdoorsmen, too. So it's like, you know, that's not, that that sounds like an ape, you know. So um, we couldn't see it. We tried to form a perimeter and kind of flush it out. That didn't work. And we were kind of we were a little nervous because we couldn't see it and stuff. But um, uh, other things happened that night. We went up onto a higher... Uh, there was kind of a levee overlooking the lake, and we shined a spotlight down where we had heard these grunts, and we saw some eyes shine. It couldn't tell exactly you know, how high they, these eyes were. They were kind of a yellowish-green color looking back at us. Then we set up camp kind of near where we'd heard this thing, and uh, throughout the course of the night, there was something that was moaning. It was like this deep kind of mm. eerie moaning sound, and uh, I would moan back and try to imitate it, and it would answer me, and wow. that went on. And then um, the the following morning when daylight broke, we finally got our nerve up and uh, we cut through this brush where we'd heard this thing. And there was it was a beach and um, there were deep footprints, um, not real clear because it was they were very deep, but you couldn't really see a lot of definition because it was really wet, m- kind of sandy mud. And um, there were a number of turtle shells that had been torn in half, literally from top to bottom, and kind of thrown there. Um, 
and you know that that was pretty there was no remains of the turtles just the shells but mm. you know i couldn't mm. think of anything that could rip a turtle shell in half um so you know that was kind of all of that together was the most convincing thing i've experienced where i thought okay that you know that that had to be a bigfoot whatever people refer to as a bigfoot or a sasquatch because of the you know the the the, voc- the vocalizations the footprints the the animal carcasses and all that so um but yeah, I've been I've been out in the field for years and years and years, and that's still haven't had a sighting, and that's probably my closest uh, encounter. I've heard, I think I've heard vocalizations a few other times, mostly like whooping sounds, and I uh, heard a wood knock one time, and you know, just kind of random things here and there. But uh, that was the most dramatic uh, encounter that I had. I really identify with that because uh, it's the same for me. I've had what I think is a pretty darn close auditory experience with you know like like we can't say for sure it was a bigfoot because we didn't see it but we're not quite sure what would make that kind of a sound it was the same for me but but isn't it so true that even though we had a passion for it when you hear something like that and then there's other people there and you're all going what the heck is that that is not normal it really (laughs) does just light the fire right back up like even hotter than it was before and you're just like going i gotta live out here this is amazing uh, it, it's so spectacular when something like that happens. And by the way, guys, pictures of the tortoise shells that Ken is talking about are in uh, in his book as well. So uh, how large of an area is that and how far from any societal stuff is that is that area, Ken? Um, it's about uh, an hour and a half northwest of Fort Worth. Um, so it's not like real... I mean, it's you know, it's a pretty rugged area, but it's not it's not the most rugged wilderness area I've ever been in. Um, but for whatever reason, there seem to be a lot of Bigfoot reports. Um, for example, um, on the edge of Fort Worth, which I said is about an hour, an hour and a half from there, of course, you have something called the Lake Worth Monster, which was like a Bigfoot that was reported around this this lake back in the late 1960s. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> there are other creatures up in that region. They all have different local names. The the Haskell Rascal is one. Mm. Um, the mm. the Howley Him, and you know they're all Bigfoot type creatures, but they just have different local kind of legendary names. So um, you know, the, Texas has a lot. You know, a decent amount of Bigfoot sightings, mostly in the eastern and northeastern part of the state. Um, but you know, not quite like the Pacific Northwest, but. Um, I think Texas ranks like sixth or seventh as far as the number of sightings that are documented. But the, you know, uh, the, you know, wherever wherever these things are, you know, this is just my theory. I, you know, I think they're somewhat nomadic. So I mean, you know, they probably move around a little bit and uh, from different following the food chain and things like that. So, um, but uh, you know, it certainly wasn't an urban area. It was kind of kind of out there a little bit. Yeah, Texas is so cool because you think Texas and you think of dry, arid tumbleweeds rolling around, but that's just absolutely not true. And I had the chance to go out to Sam Houston at Mm. National Forest. And I mean, it's, you got woods out there, guys. And a lot of it's very dense. Some of it's more open with not as much undergrowth as other places that I've been. But then you go into another part of the park and it is very, very dense. And if it was dark, forget it. You wouldn't be able to see anything, mm-hmm. you know, within a foot of that brush if, if it didn't want you to, especially something that's born and bred out there. Yeah, Texas is a, a big state. It's got a lot of habitats. Kind of where I live in San Antonio, you get more of that kind of tumbleweed cactus kind of vibe out here uh, where I live. But, uh, you know, East Texas, Far East Texas is very much like Louisiana, and uh, it's just a lot of swamp and bottomland. And that's kind of the edge of where you were right there in Sam Houston Forest, a lot of sightings out there. And then, uh, you know, you have grasslands and some mountain ranges in the west. So, you know, a lot of diverse habitats. But most of the Bigfoot activity, like I said, is in the eastern or the or the northeastern part of the state. Is there a case or or just a, a report that you've kind of looked into a little more heavily that there was something about it that, that really took you by surprise? Hmm, gosh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm always kind of surprised, but um, uh, a couple years ago, um, our, our common friend Lyle Blackburn, uh, he and I met up in a, in a town called um, Fairfield, which is kind of halfway between us in central Texas, where I'd been tipped off to this story about a lizard man that had been sighted back in the 80s, and uh, we interviewed a guy, and... Um, 
we we put a an ad out in the local paper of the ads asking for lizard man. That's great. You know, so you, you think of the lizard man. Of course, people have heard of like the one from South uh, Carolina, uh, Bishop Bill, kind of a scaly man. Like you don't get a lot of those types of reports. Um, but anyways, we didn't get a lot of uh, information on our first trip. But subsequently, our newspaper ad. Uh, through our newspaper ad, this guy got in touch with us, and he was actually the dis- police dispatcher who was on duty the night that this thing had been seen by these kids for the first time. So he remembered everything vividly, and uh, what he described wasn't a lizard man at all. He said what the people described, they they were outside, and they saw this thing coming down the railroad tracks at them, and they said it was kind of like a, a goat man with hoofs and uh, kind of a, you know, Bigfoot with horns or antlers and hoofs and more of a goat man type thing. And it, it wandered into a, a, a deserted house and the police came out, but they were afraid to go in. And so there was this whole wow. story. But, you know, there's a situation where you've got this story or these reports of a lizard man and then you get there and start investigating and then it completely morphs into something different as a goat man now. So it's, uh, you know, that was kind of a, a 180. Uh, haven't really had anything uh subsequent you know on that turn up but uh I'm, I'm sure there are probably other examples too but that just off the top of my head that was pretty pretty radical shift <laughs> yeah that one you're like i did not see that coming okay goat man all right well we're gonna go there um at- yeah and, yeah there are goat men supposedly in texas that's yeah. uh, like i said the lake the lake worth monster which i mentioned a moment ago was often referred to as a goat man and uh there's one up in denton texas that supposedly lives under a bridge and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, I think that I've heard Lyle, uh, well, I've heard him in person say it, but, you know, he feels like a lot of the lizard man reports are just misidentified Bigfoot that, you know, they they don't really exactly have the zestfully clean showers that they can go to, and a lot of them are a little <laughs> bit dirtier, and, um, you know, they're they're not as sparkly clean as, as some of the, the big feats that others see, and that maybe these are just you know, extremely dirty and covered with moss and greens or whatever it might be, uh, Bigfoot versus a lizard man. So, uh. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, when you get into cryptozoology, there's a lot of interpretation that's, you know, through through perception and different eyewitness perceptions and perspectives. Um, to, to piggyback on Lyle's theory, I once, I mentioned to him that, uh, you know, what if you had a mangy Bigfoot? You can imagine if you had a Bigfoot Ugh. that lost all of its hair or had alopecia, I mean, that would be a pretty terrifying looking thing. Oh, <laughs> it gosh. might look more like a, like a lizard man, too. Oh. Uh, uh, you, know. you know, I've actually never pictured that before, like really stopped and thought about that. But no, that's on the no list for me. Nope. I want to see a Bigfoot so bad. But I can say that I don't, I mean, depending on where you are, who you're, I mean, there's a whole list of factors, right? When, when it comes to a sighting. But uh, yeah, that would that may mess with your head a little bit at first before you maybe put together that no, there's probably a scientific reason the poor thing has no hair. It's not like he doesn't want the hair. It's just he, he he's he's sorry for terrifying you. Yeah, that I well, that's it. I like that. I like that piggyback idea. I've never actually thought about that. Hmm, terrifying. Um, is there a place, and it could be anywhere in the world, that you want to go? specifically to research or search for Sasquatch that you haven't gone yet? Oh, for, for Sasquatch? Yeah, um, yeah I, I would say um, I've always wanted to do like Mongolia or, you know, obviously the Himalayas um, uh, for the Yeti. I mean, haven't been there yet. Or any of the surrounding mountain ranges, which would include like the Altai Mountains of Mongolia and Russia where they have the Almasti. Um, you know, they have different names when you go up there and... Um, the Carpathian Mountains, the Tian Shen. So, I mean, there's like, you know, in Asia, they're kind of referred to as yetis or wild man, or they have local names. But, you know, it, it seems like a, a, a either a subspecies of a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or a related form. Uh, but I would love to do some Asian uh, uh, kind of mountain trekking and, and search for some of those types of creatures. I've been uh, obsessed lately with uh, watching shows especially specifically about Everest and uh, oh, just those folks that <laughs> yeah there's so many on um, am- both Amazon Prime and well specifically actually Amazon Prime video but uh, watching what those 
just the physical feats that they put themselves through. And of course, at some points, you're going, you're yelling at the TV going, you need to go back. It's already two o'clock in the afternoon. Turn back. But, you know, you, you like learn all these time frames that they need to, right. to do. They and, don't turn back. They're not yeah. going to have time. They'll, they'll die. It's yeah. pretty, pretty amazing like, that people will put themselves to that extreme. Incredible. And you learn all the names of the all these the icefall doctors and all this this amazing stuff up there and I always wanted to fly into that insane airport the Lukla airport and then just have enough stamina and and the cardio uh, space to walk even just up to base camp you know i don't know if they let people just traipse around there but even just to be able to see it would be i think pretty cool so i'm i've just been devouring content like that yeah like crazy i, I watch a lot reason. of everest yeah I watch a lot of everest dockies too and actually i know we keep getting off topic but one i rented was on uh, sir edmund hillary and uh, tenzing norgay and the, the first guys to summit and i mean you want to talk about a couple of badasses i mean the people nowadays you know that like you said they're in great shape but everything's roped they have ropes and yeah. guides and sherpas carrying their stuff Hillary, when he got to the Hillary step, he had to basically wedge his body in between a rock, icy rock crevice and climb. You know, there's no rope. He was the first one, so he had to, like, climb, like, 50 feet straight up. And, I mean, when you watch this thing, it's like, man, talk about a tough son of a gun that, that was able to do that. And he and Tenzing were able to summit the first ones. I mean, that, to me, is just mind-blowing that they were able to do that. And you have such a good point because that's the point – you know, we're, we're watching these docks and there's a ladder, like just vertical, just straight up and down. And there's another, there's all these bottlenecks that happen on Everest. Mm -hmm. If you, if anybody is interested in watching this, it's very fascinating. Uh, and, and the human spirit and, and also bad choices and good choices. And, but the part that Ken's talking about, it's always a bottleneck and e that's even with a damn ladder. They can't even go up with crampons and ropes. And like he said, mm -hmm. like you said, I mean, the guy, is a total badass to do that with absolutely nothing. So did you see the one? Sorry, everybody, we are way off topic, but it's just <laughs> we're on a roll with this, okay? It's all um, related somehow. It is. <laughs> and, and don't worry, a Yeti story is coming. You just don't know it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, did you see the guy? He, he summits Everest, but then he had the plan to go. I can't remember if he started up the south side and then went down the north. But he, anyway, he summited. And then his plan was to go down and then come back up and over again. He, he didn't uh, make it, actually, just to spoil oh, the story. Wow. But I'm going, man, these guys are, they're a little crazy. I mean, we're all a little crazy, but holy crap. I mean, the, what these folks put themselves through is, is pretty amazing. So anyway, um, mm -hmm. sorry, everybody. Okay. Um, I think I would be remiss if I didn't ask this because people email me and go, well, you had Ken on and you didn't ask this. So forgive this question. It's more about, uh, do you think Bigfoot are opportunistic than anything? And I'm not trying to get conspiratorial, but it, it the gist of the question is, do you think Bigfoot is tied in at all with any of the missing people reports that are out there? Um... I mean, maybe, you know, a very, very small percentage, but I don't think, I don't get the sense that these creatures are hyper-aggressive towards humans, quite the opposite. Um, similar to other animals, you know, even bears, mountain lions, a lot of large, scary predators <laughs> will flee from humans. They're very shy and reticent, and they would rather not have contact with us. Um, now, what I always tell people is that having spent a lifetime searching for evidence, finding evidence, looking, analyzing, interviewing eyewitnesses, I'm 90% convinced that Bigfoot exists. So I have to square that with a very strong uh, skeptical argument about, well, why can't we find them? You know, it just doesn't seem, it just seems inexplicable that at this point we haven't found, a, you know, a de the remains of a dead one or, you know, something like that. So you know, the only way I can explain it is that is adaptation, which is a word we use a lot at the zoo. And, you know, all animals, of course, have amazing adaptations that allow them to survive in, you know, a very specific niche or role. And, um, you know, those adaptations, if you don't fully understand them, uh, you think that it's miraculous that this animal can perform whatever specific adaptation it has, physical or behavioral. Now, Bigfoot, I think Bigfoot, is adapted to avoid us, Homo sapiens. I think it's intelligent enough to recognize that we're its greatest threat. 
uh, that it will go extinct if we find them, if we are able to. So, you know, we, we're basically, if you consider that Bigfoot is probably somewhere on the homo line, it's a hominin or a hominid of some type, it, uh, you know, we, we would be in kind of direct competition in, in many ways. So, um, so that's why I think they, they typically want to avoid us, and that's borne out by most of the sightings that you hear about where Bigfoot typically is walking away, trying to get away, hiding behind a tree, you know, not wanting contact with the humans. There are, of course, accounts of them peeking in windows and things like that, which is pretty scary. But um, and there's the rock throwing, and that's a pretty commonly reported aggression. And that's more of a that's more of a demonstrative thing, I think, where they're just trying to scare you and get you out of there and throw a big rock at you. That, that you know, it seems like that should work. But no, I don't think that they are specifically seeking out humans to abduct for whatever reason. I don't think they're cannibalistic against humans. I don't think. You know, any of that stuff. I think occasionally people may disappear if they run across one, and maybe, it's, like any animal, it's being territorial and defending its territory, and maybe there could be something that would happen and someone would, you know, tragically be killed. But I, I think those are very exceptionally rare incidents. I don't think that uh, Bigfoot is abducting or killing people on a regular basis. And uh, I think that, you know, if you look at like a lot of Native American legends, Many of the stories are about a Bigfoot or Sasquatch kidnapping young maidens or children or things like that. And I, I think a lot of that is probably just kind of built into the Native American mythos of these creatures because of respect and because, you know, there's always kind of a parable or a lesson in, in a lot of Native American traditions, you know. And so the lesson there is, you know, you respect Bigfoot. You don't want to go up by yourself and onto the mountain where he might be. You know, they would say he's going to kidnap you, but I don't think that's really the case. I think it's just kind of a message there, which is you don't want to go in the Bigfoot's territory, you know, respect yeah. his space. So, Swinging back to your auditory experiences, do you think that, like, the you know, the sound of the moaning, I think, would mm-hmm. be pretty damn freaky to hear. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. care if you're with a bunch of people or not. Um, I mean... Do you think that it was doing that because it, you know, it was trying to scare you out of the area? Or do you think that was, what was the purpose of that particular noise, do you think? Um, Gosh, I don't know. That's, uh, I would be completely speculating. I think if it had wanted to scare us out, and initially that's what those first noises we heard sounded like. It was like an aggressive grunting, like, get out of here, and we didn't. Um. I think we would have experienced more of the rock throwing and tree shaking and things like that that most Mm -hmm. primates will revert to to scare you. And we didn't really get a lot of that. So in terms of what the moaning was about, I don't know. I mean, maybe it was trying to communicate with us or, you know, maybe it was in discomfort. (laughs) Maybe as it was eating its turtles, maybe. (laughs) I don't know. It's a Zantac. It's a good question. It is, Shannon, but I really don't have a good theory as to what, why these types of vocalizations and I think that researchers should be cautious in terms of trying to be overly interpretive of anything they're experiencing because the bottom line is we just don't know I mean we can speculate about why they do this or why we Mm -hmm. think they do that you know Uh, vocalizations are always a form of communication in the primate world so it was trying to communicate something to us but I don't think it was trying to scare us because the moans were pretty distant. It felt like it was farther away from us at that point. And um, though it was highly disturbing, it wasn't like it didn't make you feel threatened, like I got to get out of here now kind of thing. So, Come on, Ken, you know that was the witch of the woods. That wasn't even the Bigfoot anymore. He was long gone. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the moaning thing. I don't, when you were just talking about the, the Native American, you know, the warnings and the, you know, the stories that I, the, I don't know, my mind just flashed back to the moaning sound. I'm going, I don't, no, I don't want to hear that. That wouldn't be fun. Um, how about, you know, them being proven, would that be, advantageous at all if the entire human race was like yes they are real here's the proof we had a body or dna or whatever that looks like would that be you know do they need that do they need to be protected at all well they definitely need to be protected and uh, in some places they are skamania county washington there's an ordinance that protects sasquatch from being harmed i've heard the similar things in place in uh, whitehall new york and uh Bellingham, Washington. So there are areas, believe it or not, even though it's it's not an animal that's been proven to exist, there are some local governments that have 
taken that step to, to put uh, an act in place to protect them. Of course, I think they need to be protected, no doubt. Uh, I think they're highly endangered. Um, they were they were here first, and they just like all animals, they need habitat to thrive. Um, as far as, you know, if, if everyone, if it were suddenly to be proven to the world, which I'm all for, obviously that's what I'm working for every day, um, you know, there's no doubt it's going to create a huge world of problems for everyone. Um, maybe not so much in the crazy pandemic age we're living in right now because everyone's kind of worried about other things uh, that don't have to do with out what's going on out in the wilderness somewhere. But, um, you know, think about the, the impact that it would have on the social structure. Um, you would have people that were in a state of panic that lived in some of those rural areas you might have some gung-ho vigilantes out there trying to hunt them or kill them. Uh, you would probably have, you know, there would be economic consequences because certain people would be afraid to go into the woods or certain industries like logging industries and things would be hampered. So if and when Bigfoot is proven to exist, uh, I think it is going to have a, a pretty earth-shattering effect on uh, on our society. Uh, it'll be, it'd be pretty fascinating to see how... Uh, how that all happens but i hope people do understand if it does happen that it's just another animal it's not out to get us it's not going to take over the planet it's not going to kill us it's just uh it's just another one in the long line of remarkable animal discoveries of the past century yeah they won't like come out of the woods or atop horses and speaking english anytime soon right so we should be okay <laughs> Not in my book. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> then we'll really be scared. Then y'all can really be scared. Um, okay, so we it's time is ticking down. We've had such a fun conversation. I'm sorry to everybody. It's gone everywhere. No. We can run um, a little over if we have to. Okay. Do you think? <laughs> um, so... This is this is a tough one, but I do like to to ask it because I have what I call my no list or my hell no list or whatever you know you want to call it with all kinds of things. Uh, but you know you you've admitted, hey, I've never seen a Bigfoot, and you would of course like to, like many of us. What would your most perfect or most ideal, I should say, sighting look like? What would that be? Um, for me personally, yeah. Well, this is going to sound grisly to some people, but my perfect ideal sighting would be I'm walking through the woods and I step over a dead one because then I know that I can obtain conclusive proof 100% by taking some of the body parts, of, you know, whatever I can take with me or cut off or whatever. That's That's definitive proof. If I had a sighting, you know, I think that would be kind of a frustrating thing. It would also be frustrating if I weren't able to get out of there with any type of conclusive proof. And right. I'm not a huge advocate of photographic evidence these days because, uh, you know, I don't think any photograph is going to be fully ever accepted as, as definitive proof. But uh, if I could find one that had died of natural causes somehow and... Uh, so I guess that's a curveball for you, Shannon. I, my no, ideal I like sighting that. Is, a dead, that... is a dead one because uh, then, then I can prove it, uh, you know beyond a doubt that it exists it, but that uh, beyond com- that that's an awesome i don't have answer. those great aspirations like uh, other some people have these aspirations to somehow befriend bigfoot like harry and the hendersons like you're going to communicate with right. it and you know right. some form some kind of bond or i i you know i'm realistic enough to know that that's not going to happen but uh, i would you know either way i would love to see one but um you know i'm in it to win it so i mean i want to find proof conclusive proof that they exist so apologize if I piggyback on the word grizzly, but you walk over a full full body Bigfoot. He's in pretty good shape, but he's dead. What what part do you take? If, you know, well, if, if you can't logistically take out that much, what do you take? That's an, that's a great question. Uh, actually, Dr. Grover Krantz, uh, iconic Bigfoot researcher and physical anthropology professor, had a section in his book about what you should do, and he said you should chop off the biggest part you can take. And, of course, the most important thing would be the skull. And I imagine on Bigfoot, the skull would probably be huge and massive, and you'd have to be able to chop off its head, so you hopefully have a chainsaw or something. Um, but uh, short of a head, a hand, or a finger, mm-hmm. uh, you know, whatever parts you could take, um, teeth, would, you know, are very diagnostic. So, you know, typically in, in, in terms of identifying any animal uh, or uh, describing any animal scientifically, you know, you usually start with the skull, the teeth, and dentition, and then, you know, hands and fingers, things like that. So any, any of those parts, I think, would, 
would be difficult for a scientist to refute if you walked into their <laughs> laboratory and dropped a even a Bigfoot finger on the table. I think that they, they might have to accept it at that point. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it does sound grisly because you presumably would have to hack some of these body parts off with, yeah. a, with an axe or a chainsaw, and that sounds like something out of a Rob Zombie movie, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> It, you'd have to revert to. Can you imagine <laughs> coming out? You're, we're walking into this nice, clean, sterile environment. You just plop a massive Sasquatch head, you know, on this stainless steel table and go, what you got to say now? Hmm? Yep. Imagine in your faces. face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a mic drop, okay? Uh, <laughs> no, honestly, I, I've asked that question, I don't know how many times, countless, and that's the best answer I've heard. So that was a huge round of applause to you. I love it. It's a perfect answer. Makes it makes incredible sense to me. Well, I'm um, let's switch gears off of Bigfoot now again, guys. That is the essential guide to Bigfoot. It is an ebook and paperback form through Amazon. So let's talk just a little bit about flying humanoids because mm-hmm. th- these dudes are or things, entities, beings, whatever the heck they are, they're everywhere. And there's been old reports. There's been new reports, including. Uh, you know, mass sightings in certain areas. Uh, I mean, what, so what is a a typical description of a flying humanoid? And by the way, I should mention that that Ken also has uh, a book about this. And I don't remember what, what year did that come out, Ken? 2013. Okay. That is also available on, on Amazon. Is that, sorry, is that specifically Amazon or is that everywhere? Barnes Noble, all that stuff? They used to be at Barnes and Noble, but I think it's. I've heard recently it might be going out of print, but uh, they're still available on Amazon, and sometimes you'll find them at a used bookstore, like a half price books kind of thing. So. Okay, awesome. I just didn't want to misspeak if it was available in more places than Amazon. So yeah, what's a typical description of these things? Well, that's one of the problematic aspects, and first of all, I have to qualify that by saying. You know, you have traditional cryptozoology, which is based on zoology, and that includes things like Bigfoot, the Yeti, the Loch Ness Monster, uh, things that could, you know, literally be undiscovered animals. And then you have kind of these fringe areas of cryptozoology, which involves things like flying humanoids, lizard men, goat men, and some of those other dog men, some of those other really weird anthropomorphic creatures that don't make any sense zoologically. So I don't look at any of those types of creatures as true cryptids, um, they're kind of fringe cryptids, um, and you know, for a number of reasons. One, the physical descriptions are impossible. You know, they shouldn't match with anything that's known in, the, in fossil history or in evolutionary terms. Um, but I've interviewed many people that have had experiences and encounters, and they, you know, they're very credible and sincere uh, when they talk about these. Now, the other thing is there is no consistent model or archetype for a flying humanoid. Maybe with Mothman, if you go up to, you know, in and around Point Pleasant. Many of the reports that started in the 1960s and uh, you know up until modern times, people have described kind of this six and a half foot tall humanoid form, sturdy man-like legs, um, arms and wings, and the wings are typically described. Well, not always arms and wings; it's kind of a, a subjective thing. But the wings are kind of you know 10 feet across, which doesn't make sense for a six and a half foot tall body. Big red glowing eyes, of course, is the most commonly reported feature on Mothman, that these eyes put people in kind of a hypnotic, trance-like state. Uh, Low slung head, so that's kind of the the standard description. But then when you go around the world and look at other flying humanoids, like uh, in England there's something called the Owl Man, in Washington State the Bat Squatch, Um, you know, the Van Meter Visitor of Iowa. All these other flying humanoid creatures I've investigated, some in Mexico, they're all completely different in terms of description. Some are kind of more bird-like with feathers, but still man-like. Some are more bat-like and have bat-like wings and bat-like features, but also humanoid features. Um, so it's kind of a, a hodgepodge of different physical descriptions, and uh, some are strictly humanoid and just have wings. Um, so that's one of the reasons that I consider the flying humanoids to be more of a sort of metaphysical phenomenon, something that is kind of a shape-shifting type of manifestation that takes different forms um, that is not, you know, necessarily a flesh and blood, true flesh and blood creature. Um, But, you know, that's, uh, in terms of Bigfoot, I think it's a more compelling argument because the eyewitness descriptions are very consistent all the time, but you don't really get that with the flying humanoids. Can I just say that the bat squatch got the shit into the stick on that one with his name? I'm sorry. It's just... 
I feel really bad for the guy, you know, <laughs> bad, bad squatch. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, some of our cryptid names are kind of goofy, and a lot of them are invented by the newspapers, typically, right. so. Uh, yeah, um, poor guy. He's like, that's not my name, it's so much better than that, gosh. <laughs> What about what about a report or a case where people, I mean, they really, really got the crap scared out of them? Like it was a terrifying report. Well, um, you know, I inter- interviewed one guy and got to know him pretty well uh, here in San Antonio, Texas, that had a flying humanoid encounter in the 1990s. His name is Frank Ramirez, and uh, he was pretty terrified. He, uh, it was a life-changing experience, traumatic experience for him. Uh, he was younger, living on the south side of San Antonio, and he heard something, uh, he was living with his grandmother at the time, he heard something on the roof, and so he kind of went out to investigate and had, I guess, a stick or something, some type of weapon, and he said this thing was perched on the roof, and it basically, it was, it unfurled its wings and kind of stood up in front of him, and he said it had like this long face that was kind of like, it was a human-like face, but the chin was stretched down Mm. to the shape of a beak, and uh, black eyes, and big black wings, and he just got so scared, obviously terrified that he just started running and just ran and ran down the street, and finally some people found him, and he kind of collapsed in a kind of a state of shock. And um, so he spent his whole life uh, trying to figure out what it was he encountered that night, and uh, he's, he, you know, he subsequently he became an artist somewhat, and he would one of his therapies was to draw pictures of it to kind of, you know... Wow. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, that's just one example. But a lot of people, a lot of people that saw Mothman were very terrified. Of mm-hmm. course, uh, Mothman seemed to have a, a tendency, as you know, Shannon, to chase people's cars and pop up out of the darkness. And that seems to be one of the commonalities with all the flying humanoid reports around the world. Is whatever these things are, they love to terrify people. They don't physically attack people. There's right. no documented example of that. But they're constantly chasing people popping up out of the dark and just very menacing and, and terrifying. It reminds me of another cryptid that I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the poor guy's name, but a dog man. A, a, mm. a dog man is much the same where it just doesn't really care if you see it. It's much more kind of in your face and aggressive. And it's uh, yep. the dog man is so different than a Bigfoot, like you said, that they just try to avoid humans as much as possible, which who can blame them? I mean, we're mess most of the time. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> I think there's a, a connection. I think dog man and, and flying humanoids are a related phenomenon or the same phenomenon because it's just, it's just like you said. They're hyper-aggressive, but physically they can't exist. There's no biological explanation for a half-man, half-canid type right. creature. So. And, and people also describe other residual things, um, uh, attachment-type phenomenon where they go home after their sighting and suddenly there's poltergeist activity mm-hmm. or weird psychic things of UFOs flying overhead. So all of that seems to be related somehow. So that's why I, I definitely think all that stuff is, is metaphysical. See, and isn't that so interesting? You mentioned the tie-ins with something then happening in people's homes. And, you know, another type of a flying humanoid would be like a bruja, like a witch, you know. And... Mm-hmm. But when you think of a witch, you don't think of what that man saw that terrified him so badly. Like, what a description, like the the elongated chin and the black eyes. And, you know, I'm sure he wouldn't call that a, a witch, right? Um, but or maybe it's just, again, that's a religious side of things tying in and, and just descriptions are different in different places. But so for you, you really do feel like these things, you know, for lack of a better term, they are, I mean, paranormal is a very gray area anyway. It just means mm-hmm. something abnormal. But much more strange, right, than anything else that you've ever looked into is this flying humanoid thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's a multifaceted thing where you have all kinds of theories about conspiracies and UFOs and curses. And so there's, mm-hmm. it kind of gets kind of, gets a little messy sometimes. But, um you know, it's definitely one of the scarier things that I've investigated in terms of, you know, people often associate these things, of course, with premonitions of tragic events. Uh, as I'm sure you're familiar with, there's there's a theory about a Mothman curse that, you know, people that become involved in right. the case will die of mysterious circumstances. Uh, I've never had that fear or concern, and knock on wood, I've been investigating flying humanoids, Mothman, and others 
for many years. But um, uh, yeah, it's, it's not my first choice in terms of something to go out and look for because I do think that there's kind of an ominous, evil, mm-hmm. negative energy. And I'm not necessarily a spiritual person. I'm more of a scientist. But I do associate these things with some type of negative energy. Would you ever want to see one? Ah, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, would anyone believe me? <laughs> you know, right. Oh, aren't you the guy that wrote that book? Right. <laughs> good point. That's a good point. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, you may not be able to tell anyone, but would you want to see yeah, one? Yeah, <laughs> you know what, Shannon? I, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly fearless person when it comes to all of these monsters and things, and that's why I've dedicated my life to it. So I think that I, I would be you know, willing to experience that just to understand if I could better what, you know, what it entails. Uh, but it's, it's not my first choice. I'd rather run across a Bigfoot or, or a Loch Ness monster before a, a flying humanoid for sure. You, you say that now, but then we call you and you're just like, you're crying in the corner and rocking back and forth and you're like <laughs> sketching stuff like in the Mothman prophecies, you know, We're like, Ken, come back, come back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just don't know yeah. how people people are impacted. I mean, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I mean, I didn't even mention the case in Mexico where the police officer got a claim he was attacked by a flying witch. He mentioned witches, a bruja, attacked his police car, and he passed out and blacked out in fear. And uh, mm. I interviewed this guy years later, and he was still like sobbing and crying, you know. And wow. this is like a, a uh, this is a pretty tough police officer that patrols one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Monterey, Mexico. But he was just, uh, you know, he was like crying like a little girl. So, I mean, it's it's a pretty traumatic experience, no doubt. How close did, did he get to one? It jumped on the hood of his car and started clawing at him through his windshield. Oh, and I that's remember when that he, one. Yes. That's when he blacked out. And uh, he was found a few minutes later by uh, other responding officers and the EMT workers. And they had to take him to the hospital because he was in shock, so... Now, just conjecture, but do you does he think that it made him pass out, or he passed out from the fear and the and the shock of the, of the thing? Uh, um, probably just I would think just the shock of the thing. You yeah. know, I mean the way he describes the incident, it's pretty pretty much like uh, you're suddenly in a in a horror movie that's come to life. You know, this flying witch with giant black eyes is on top mm. of your car clawing at you through the windshield. Like, I don't know if anyone would be able to stay conscious through that, honestly. I know it's a totally fake video, and every few years it'll it'll come back and, and cycle through. I know you've seen it. It's a, a lonely, dusty road, and there's no street lights or anything, and they're filming mm-hmm. out this truck, and it basically looks like the girl from The Ring or something walking in the middle of the road in a nightgown yeah. as such. And uh, it's just, I mean, I know it's a fake video, but, it, you know, that's the kind of thing that you think of, you know, and then it sprouts wings and it's jumping on your car and then you go, oh, hell no, no, I, I, I don't know. It just, it, it would, it would make you change all sorts of plans that you might have had for, for travel and, and maybe who, who's your, <laughs> who's your fellow next to you? You know, if do you have your ride or die? Are you guys armed? Like, what, what does the situation look like, you know, to where you're, you're rethinking everything. And, and like you said, this man crying i mean after all these years about that that's i mean that is horrible because it does uh it affects everyone so differently and and sometimes so traumatically that i mean you know that if he could go back he would say i don't want to see that damn thing yeah no no doubt um i don't know anyone that's had a a flying humanoid encounter that's tried to replicate the experience right you know try to try to put it in the past so yeah and (laughs) It's funny you mentioned how they, you know, they really don't give a crap if you see them. I had gone to a Wells Fargo here in Vegas, and I had to sit down with one of the people because I was uh, changing some stuff on my account. And I don't know how it came up, but I, we got on the subject, and I told him what I did, and I showed him my little, I have a little nerdy business card with my, you know, into the fray and all the Bigfoots and all this <laughs> stuff on, and it's my nerd card, and uh he he goes, yeah, I actually had a really weird experience coming in on the 95 uh, on a lonely stretch of road, you know, no no street lights, nothing like that, me and a friend. And he said, it, within the wash of the headlights, they had the brights on, there's no cars coming in the opposite direction. And he said this thing with massive wings, just, it kind of like fluttered twice, like pop, pop, and then he could tell that it was not touching the ground anymore. And I said, well, about how tall was he? He said, oh, six to seven feet, easy. 
And uh, we were, he goes, thankfully, we were driving pretty fast. And uh, I did not slow down because, of course, I asked that question. He goes, no way did we slow down. And they know what they saw. You know, he's like, it was a humanoid figure with massive wings and it did two pumps and it was off the ground. And, you know, of course, it's pitch black then behind you uh, when you're driving out in situations like that. But he goes, I still can't explain that to this day. But you know that the thing you know, would probably be hearing uh, a car or seeing the lights off in the distance. So, it's, you know, you're kind of like, well, why wouldn't it just stay crouched down where it was or whatever? It's like it just did that to, to show off. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. Hmm. Yeah, that, that again, you know, it seems to be one of the common threads. If you look at a lot of different flying humanoid encounters, it's uh, these things seem to be almost like uh, I think I write about in the book that they almost seem to be feeding off of our fear, like emotional vampires. Like yeah. they get energized. They're somehow energized or stimulated by, by the fear that they uh, invoke. So uh, They're real a-holes, really. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. Just like the Bottom dog line. man. Yeah. Big, big on the no list. Like, no thanks. Eh, Bigfoot. Heck yeah. Can't wait. Hopefully someday. But, you know, it's like, like lightning striking, you know? I guess if that's all we get is the auditory experience, that was pretty damn cool too. But it would be amazing to see well, one one yeah, of these days. Yeah. yeah, I always like to point out to people that you know, you if you look at the the pioneers, the horsemen as we call them in the Bigfoot field, guys like John Green and Renee De Hinden, mm-hmm. Peter Byrne, Bob Titmus, Grover Krantz, all of those guys spent like years and years and years out in the brush in highly active areas looking for evidence and they some of them found footprints and other things but you know out of those bob titmus was the only one that ever claimed he actually saw right. a bigfoot so um you know it's not as easy to do i think as, as some people think i think there's a lot of luck involved in terms of being in the right place at the right time so you're not going to move to uh sam houston area and put out like like oreos or i don't know what else <laughs> people are putting out for, for the bigfoots but <laughs> They're trying all kinds of things now, sparkly objects and yeah. Twizzlers and yeah. Oh, Twizzlers! Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Just it might be uh, that might have been in Harry and the Hendersons when he's yeah. kicked back on the recliner. You know, he's like, "Where's my Twizzlers? Damn it, let's go!" <laughs> yeah, you know what? And I'm not trying to make. I, I encourage thinking outside the box and experimentation. So yes. there are big for researchers that are trying different things. I, I'm I'm all for that. I think you gotta. That's part of the process is to to experiment with things like that. Yeah, and that being said, that before the incredible whistle that we heard at Salt Fork, we were actually doing something that you might even see in Finding Bigfoot. Uh, we were, we'd cracked a glow stick and we were whirring it around and it was making that cool noise like um, like in Crocodile Dundee and when he goes up to call call his people in, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And it wasn't long after that we had that incredible experience. So yeah, it's all about thinking outside the box. It's just, I just like to keep things light and laugh about it because you never know when you said twizzlers i'm like hey yeah heck yeah they might be totally into that might get really stuck in their teeth though they don't really have the the floss situation out there or maybe they do i don't know they're like what do you think a rat's tail is for you know (laughs) (laughs) they're like shannon yes we do (laughs) that could be a problem and a lot of people leave out the peanut butter because uh well cliff barrickman for example has this nice uh i forget the name of the researcher in kentucky but he put out the uh Nutella and uh, this thing supposedly Bigfoot stuck its fingers in the Nutella and they got a cast out of that out of, out of some fingers. So know you know they that. they wow. do apparently like peanut butter and Nutella. I know a lot of researchers that try to leave that out there and moreover leave the the jar closed because if uh, if something is able to unscrew the jar, right. then you can eliminate right. almost every animal in the woods that Even doesn't have right. an opposable thumb. So. Yeah, I totally agree with the peanut butter jar thing. Because, yes, as you said, you, you're not really going to find a raccoon that's able to figure that one out. Um, it's just going to be a massive mess if they can even figure out how to get in that thing. But, yeah, absolutely. So uh, just tying up on the flying humanoid subject, do you still get correspondence? Are you still looking at stuff like that? Like, when, And are there any very, very recent reports of these things out there? Um, I get a report every couple of months from somewhere. The most recent one I got was from the Panhandle in Texas. I've been getting a few mostly from from West Texas uh, and the Panhandle areas. And um, this guy claims he saw a, you know, 
flying humanoid type thing, but he said it had kind of a beak, but it was a very humanoid body, and it was just kind of soaring overhead. And uh, mm. that was probably about, I don't know, want to say just a few months ago that he got in touch with me. But oh. um, yeah, I mean, he seemed pretty sincere, like I said. Um, but I, you know, I, I, as you know, I investigate a lot of different things. So I'm you know, while I love to make time for all of it, I, I kind of have to pick and choose my battles at this point. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I'll, I'll interview someone over the phone if I find their their initial contact to be very compelling. Um, it's pretty rare that I'll actually travel out to and investigate an area unless it's a very super recent report and, you know, there's some type of exceptional situation. But, you know, more often than not, I, you know, I just conduct the interview and, um with the flying humanoids, I have a folder and a dossier, and I just try to to organize everything as much as possible in there. I got a really weird one from Arizona, uh, a guy, and you know I didn't want to totally uh, blow him off because he he seemed like he was real credible and sincere. But what he described, and he actually drew a sketch of this thing, and it was like uh, he said it was like a large bat-like creature, about 12 to 14 feet tall, with mm-hmm. glowing eyes and giant teeth. And the picture he drew me looked like something out of like a fantasy video game or something. So it was almost like, <laughs> right. you know, so, I, you know, I get this too. I interviewed the guy and he seemed pretty, pretty sincere. But, you know, those happen about every couple months or whatever. That's interesting. The the one from where you are in Texas or you're that area in Panhandle, it had a beak, he said. But then mm-hmm. the other report from the man in San Antonio area he said that the chin was just so very long. So, I mean, maybe if something was flying, the long chin would look like a beak or vice versa, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, that's yeah, so strange. Per- perception, yeah. It's all about, you know, usually these sightings only last a few seconds. People are in a highly charged emotional state, terrified, panicky. And so, you know, your your imagination and your memory will kind of fill in the dots. But um People are going to describe things kind of in different ways based on those experiences. But I do have a similar, you know, the, the beaked flying humanoid. I do have a uh, a gentleman that I interviewed in Guadalajara, Mexico. I'm not sorry, not Guadalajara, Tijuana, uh, that claimed he saw something similar to that uh, a few years ago. So when this other guy in the panhandle gave me the description, I kind of thought to myself, wow, that's kind of similar to this other. So sometimes that happens where you get the, uh, you know, some similar common feature and two unrelated mm. cases that pops up and that's always kind of intriguing that's yeah that then you're kind of going well this this lends more credence to this whole thing a little bit yeah i can't thank you enough for coming on it's been long 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 overdue and uh yeah it's it's just been a pleasure to to chat with you today ken uh will you please let everybody know where to find you and of course your books well thanks again for having me on shannon i'm sorry it took us so long that uh this it was definitely worth the wait. Uh, well, enjoyed speaking you. with you today. I uh, wish everyone out there the best. Hope everyone's staying safe and, and feeling well. Um, yeah, I've got a website, KenGerhard.com. I'm also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. People can find me in all those. Um, I will be, uh, my books are available, as you said, e-books and uh, also print books of, of Essential Guide to Bigfoot and others can be found on Amazon. And uh, I also have a YouTube channel that I've just lately been starting getting started on, and I've been posting kind of uh, little short videos on different cryptids on there. So, uh, you know, I try to be as many places as I as I can be. But uh, and later this year, I will be appearing, uh, doing some lectures. There are some events that are still planned. I'll be at the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, in July. Uh, the uh, Upper Peninsula, Michigan Bigfoot Conference in uh, August. Hopefully, I'll be at Mothman this year if it's still going on. Yeah. And uh, the Van Meter Visitor Festival in Iowa this year. I'm excited about that. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be hopefully traveling around a little bit and doing some, some public appearances as well. Yeah, let's hope things get back to normal enough to where some of these conferences can go on. We hope so. We may have to make some adjustments. But, uh, you know, we have, hopefully if we're all smart about it, we can uh, get some of these things going again. I need to create an, an ITF conference and and drag all you guys, especially you Texas boys out here, get Nick and Lyle and you and get Craig out here. And, uh, yeah, there's nothing out here like that. Not in Vegas. There's We do all the UFO stuff for obvious reasons, but that would be uh, mm-hmm. pretty, pretty cool. But, yeah, uh, uh, definitely. I'm down. 
again again thank you so much and uh of course the door is always welcome for anything that you want to come on uh itf and talk about well very much appreciated and uh yeah thanks to everyone who, for listening and uh hopefully we'll talk again real soon well i'm so and so i was given this name by my parents i've been to such and such a college i've done these things in my profession i produce a little bar buddha says forget it that's not true that's some of the story. That's all gone. That's all past. I want to see the, the real you you are now. But nobody knows who that is. Because we don't uh, know ourselves except through listening to our echoes and consulting our memories. But then there's a real you, and that again leads us back to this question. Uh, who are you? That is the real you. See how they play with this exam by the cohorts to get you to come out of your shell and find out who you really are.
he says, uh, when you settle down in the train to read your newspaper and uh, so on, you are not the same person who uh, a little while ago left the platform. If you think you are, you are linking your moments up in the train. And this is what binds you to the wheel of birth and death. But when you know that every moment in which you are is the only moment, this comes into Zen, the master will say to somebody, oh, get up and walk across the room. And he comes back and he says, where are your footprints? They've gone. So where are you? Who are you? When we are asked who we are, we usually give a kind of recitation of a history. Straight, 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 straight.